Thanks. Uh, hi, yeah, I'm, uh, Todd Strader. Uh, I'm an engineer at Hester Rumor Trading. We're an algorithmic trading shop in uh, headquartered in New York. Um, and both uh, as part of my day job and recreationally a very later uh, contributor. So, uh, yeah, Stefan said we're going to talk about um, an alternative to encrypted Verilog. Um, so, I'm sure pretty much everyone here is familiar with the idea of IP. Um, IP blocks are reusable hardware components um, developed by a uh, third party uh, and uh, licensed to you so you don't have to build everything from scratch. Um, they, uh, they demonstrate our inability to name things as an industry and um, often are distributed as uh, in encrypted RTL via this uh, IEEE standard. Um, it's not required that anyone distributes this this way. They can obviously distribute uh, plain text RTL if they want, um, but this is how um, a lot of IP is often uh, distributed. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're not familiar with the scheme, the basic idea is that the, uh, the IP vendor will take the, their RTL, their secret RTL, uh, run it through a symmetric encryption key, and produce uh, an encrypted data block. Um, they'll then get the, uh, the public half of a public-private uh, key pair from uh, an EDA vendor. Uh, they'll encrypt their symmetric key to produce the key block. Uh, this pair, the data in key block, is essentially the, uh, the shipped uh, encrypted RTL that will go to the end user. Uh, the end user will then take that, uh, insert it into whatever their EDA tool is, which has the, uh, the secret half of the key pair. They'll use that secret key to, to decrypt the, uh, the IP vendor's symmetric key, uh, which will then in turn be used to decrypt the data block to get the RTL um, to do whatever they're going to do with uh, the RTL, be it you know, simulate it, synthesize it, whatever they're going to do. Um, the, uh, th there's a number of problems with this scheme. Uh, one is that it essentially forces IP vendors to extend a circle of trust to uh, EDA vendors that they probably don't want to. Um, there have definitely been uh, cases where these uh, secret keys leak, uh, and so that's no good for these IP vendors. Um, and then beyond that, this encryption scheme is just basically broken. Um, it's possible to back out the plain text RTL uh, from the data block without knowing the key. Uh, I don't have time to get into that, but it's a, a fascinating read. I have some links at the end of the, the slide deck, so uh, if you're interested, you should definitely check that out. Um, and then, you know, probably most uh, uh, applicable to uh, the crowd here is that um, this is completely uh, antithetical to open source tools. So, uh, you know, tools like Verilator can't hide a secret key, so they can never, uh, they can never participate in this scheme. So, um, you know, if you have these encrypted uh, RTL blocks and, you know, you're a Verilator user or some other uh, open source simulator, um, you know, what are you left to do? So basically, uh, you know, you, you have a few options. You can, um, you know, you can use closed source tools to simulate these parts of your design. Maybe you like the integration testing um, outside of, say, Verilator. Um, uh, that, that's less than ideal. Uh, you can write your own behavioral model. Uh, this seems to kind of defeat the purpose of licensing IP, but you know you you are left to to do to try to figure out what's going on and, and do that. Uh, if you're if you're able to, you can try to emit you know synthesize and emit gates and simulate those gates. Um, you know this is again less than ideal than just write, running the, um, the the actual RTL. Um, you can try to go to the vendor and try to get you know either plain text RTL or obfuscated source. Um, this is a different kind of terrible because it's going to involve lawyers and negotiations and things like that. So, um, and I don't know, you can just like give up and become a farmer or something. I don't know. Um, so, so none of these are great options. Um, and so, so this kind of left me wondering, you know, like, you know, what if we could instead, you know, like, uh, compile the, the Verilog and then use it via some kind of standard interface? Like, what if we could do that? So obviously this is, this is Verilator's day job. This is what Verilator does all day long is compile Verilog. Um, and uh, the DPI, if you're not familiar, is a part of the system Verilog spec that allows for communication between the Verilog and, uh, and foreign languages. So um, if you're not familiar with the kind of uh, standard Verilator flow, uh, the, the basic gist of it is you've got your, uh, your Verilog that you want to simulate. Uh, you run it through the tool. It will emit a, uh, a C++ class, which is basically a representation of your design. Um, you will apply some of your own C++, which will do uh, marshalling of data and time. Um, uh, run through your favorite C++ compiler. 
and out pops basically a binary, which is a, uh, a simulation. It's, it's, it's able to simulate uh, your design. Um, so then, uh, basically extending from this this idea, um, what we can what we can do is uh, take, uh, you know, if if you're the IP vendor in, in this case, you can take your, your secret RTL, uh, run it through uh, Verilator. Verilator can obviously compile whatever, so it'll produce the C++ uh, class that represents this uh, secret uh, RTL. Um, and then additionally, we'll, we'll kick out uh, two more files. One is a, uh, a system Verilog wrapper that is basically a, uh, a one one port mapping, a one one uh, correspondence of ports between the secret Verilog uh, and, and this file. Uh, but it has none of the, the secret sauce inside of it. And instead, all it has in, in this file is basically uh, just uh, DPI declarations and calls to uh, map the, the I/O in that module to these uh, to these these functions, and then the uh, the secret CPP is uh, basically the implementation of those DPI functions. It's just connectors between the DPI calls and um, and the system Verilog. So then again, we run this through our um, our C++ compiler, and then instead of getting a binary now, we we uh, we compile this down to a library. Um, and essentially, uh, now what you have is uh, the secret library and the uh, system Verilog wrapper, which are now a shippable unit um, instead of uh, encrypted RTL. So we take those two files, uh, we ship them to our customer who, you know, instantiates them in their design. So they take their design plus the, uh, this encrypted, or not encrypted, this uh, compiled library, um, run it through uh, Verilator or any DPI capable simulator. Um, and and simulate the code. Um, all right. So then, basically, you know, what what, what do we what do we have here uh, at the end of the day? So basically, this allows us to um, to, to ship this uh, secret RTL and use it in any DPI capable simulator, uh, and most importantly, um, including open source simulators, because now we're not uh, we're not having to have this uh, circle of trust um, to, uh, to 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 hide this this code. Um, the, and, and essentially, we're trading encryption for uh, obfuscation via uh, the compiler. Um, some, may, uh, some, some may argue that this will allow uh, people to reverse engineer the, uh, the, the compiled code to try to figure out what is in this uh, secret RTL. But of course, at the end of the day, every simulator has to be able to compile things down to instructions that the machine is going to run. So that, uh, that object code is going to exist somewhere along the way. Uh, and you can always try to reverse engineer that. So you, you, we're not really making that problem any worse. Um, and if you've ever worked on Verilator and tried to decipher the Verilated C++, you know that's not like really a very fun thing to do. And trying to uh, decipher the compiled Verilated C++ is really not something I'd wish on anyone. So um, I'm, I'm not sure who these people are, but maybe they exist. Um, there's no possibility of leaked RTL because the RTL doesn't ship anymore, uh, which seems like a, a strong plus to me. Um, and we don't really have issues about API breakages because all we're using is, uh, you know, the DPI, which is part of the system Verilog spec. Um, and then ultimately, hopefully, the, the idea here is that, you know, if uh, people start adopting this, then uh, we can reduce the number of these uh, keys that uh, these IP vendors um, have to use to ship their encrypted RTL, which um, you know, shrinking that circle of trust again to me. I'm not. I'm not an IP vendor, but that would seem like that would be a boon for them. All right. So let's uh, let's talk about problems. What uh, what problems do we have? The, the biggest one is probably uh, top level parameters. So um, since now we're compiling this code at the IP vendor site as opposed to uh, at the uh, the end user site, um, the top level parameters have to be fixed because that's that's how Verilator works. Um, so there's a few options. One is you could just not have parameters uh, for your IP cores. That's probably uh, overly restrictive, uh, but you know maybe it fits some use cases. Um, uh, you could build the libraries on demand. So um, if your parameter space is relatively small, uh, your IP vendor oh, we're shutting down. All right. <laughs> So I can keep going. So, so basically, if um, if your parameter space is relatively small, then you can uh, just uh, you know exhaustively build all of the libraries that uh, you you may need. Um, you could also uh, imagine that you could build these things on demand. So you either email your IP vendor with uh, your 
your specific parameter configuration, or maybe there's some, um, maybe there's some uh, web interface or something that allows you to build these things on demand. Um, and uh, there's also possibilities that we could uh, we could extend Verilator uh, in the future to be able to to handle some of this. So some uh, some parameters uh, there, there's some class of parameters that uh, we think we could probably automatically convert uh, into essentially like time zero only settable wires. Um, so th those things we might be able to resolve. Um, obviously, parameters that control things like generate blocks, we can't do that uh, with that. That that wouldn't make any sense. Um, so uh, it is even possible that you know um, you know in in the future we might be able to extend this idea to be able to dynamically construct part of the, the verilator or the verilator design on the fly uh, because essentially here all we are doing is uh, building a building a, a part of the design and um, and instead just loading that um, at runtime uh, no that's fine I can't remember what's on the next slide now though but Sure, sure, sure. Um, if I understood properly in the original model, which is to distribute the RTL with uh, and use encryption, right? Well, that, that's the current scheme. That's the current scheme. Yeah. In this scheme, um, the user actually you get the RTL and then you simulate it. In, in the new scheme, you don't get the no, RTL. in the current scheme. You get encrypted RTL. Yeah, but at some point you have, I mean, when, but when you de decrypt it, your proprietary application decrypts it, 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 does, it, does, it does it show it to you? No, or, well, ah, that's I okay. mean, th this is the implicit contract, right? Like, yes, at the end of the day with the current scheme, you know, if you're, if you're an IP user, you, you get both encrypted RTL and a tool that has the key to decrypt that RTL. So is this, yeah, but those, is this a terrible scheme? Probably. But th those proprietary tools are showing you the RTL or not? No. I mean, well, that, that's, they're not supposed to. Okay, so basically you don't, you don't lose anything from the current schema to the new schema you are proposing. I mean, you are blind. Cor in correct. I mean, the, 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 security, the, the security guarantees should behave the same. Okay. Yes. You can see you know, my, my, minus the, 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 the terrible, like, you know, in, encryption holes that, you know, uh, you know are, are in, in the scheme. This might be your next slide, but what about uh, synthesis? Right, so this, this doesn't, uh, th this doesn't uh, attempt to address all, all uses of encrypted RTL. Um, uh, so that's certainly, uh, you know, wor work for, for further research. Um, you know, there, there are... Um, you, know, you, you, could, you could ask people to, to ship you a net list or things like that. I don't know. You know again, this is all like, this gets into the, the realm of negotiating with IP vendors and things like that. Um, but yes, this is, uh, um, this is orthogonal to uh, synth synthesis. So I may be one of those very strange people who have been known to debug their RTL from the Vera later source. Okay, uh, great. The, the produced Vera later. I, there have been so many times when I've stared at my design and I said, this should work, why isn't this working? Every time I look through it, I know it should work, and I end up tracing through the C++ source of Vera later, putting printfs all through the whole thing to figure out what's going on and, and actually finding things. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is if I were an IP vendor, I wouldn't find this very secure. And if I were a user, I would find the issue with the parameters a, um, a real stumbling block as to how to deal with those parameters. Uh, if there were another way around, I'm still looking for it. Uh, at the same time, when you look at uh, vendor code, I've looked at a lot of Xilinx's code. It seems like the most uh, secure thing they uh, wrap up and they guarantee that nobody can ever look at are their FIFOs. Don't ask me why. <laughs> yeah, so, so towards the reverse engineering point, uh, so, so Importantly, the uh, the source would not be shipping, so you wouldn't be able to to go in and and uh, be uh, inserting uh, printfs and things like that. Um, uh, yeah, so so you'd you'd be getting the, the object code, um, and uh, and again, you know, uh, whatever commercial you know simulators uh, people are running with with this encrypted RTL, 
um, they, they're doing the same thing. They have to, they, they have to give the machine instructions on how to simulate the RTL. So those instructions have to exist to be able to be observed at some point in the system. Um, um, and I'm sorry, I forgot, I forgot the second uh, half of your question already. <laughs> Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, parameters, yes. Um, yeah, I, I, t I totally agree with that, um, and I think, uh, so, yeah, no problem. Uh, this, uh, uh, this, this is the way to, to start, and I think that, um, you know, in, in the future, it's something that needs to be addressed, um, and uh, there, are, there are ways to stopgap it now, um, but I think that uh, in the future, we'll probably have to look to uh, how we can extend Verilator to, to address that. I don't, think, I, don't, I don't see any other way around that. All right. Um, the uh, an, an, another problem here is uh, essentially since we're we're pushing the build responsibility back onto the IP vendor, uh, whereas before uh, they're just shipping their their RTL and leaving it up to you to compile. Now we're pushing that responsibility onto them, which perhaps is a good idea. I mean, you know, hopefully they compile their RTL before they ship it, but now they would have to. Um, and uh, since different simulators are going to require different um, uh, you know different knobs uh, to be tuned turned on uh, the build of the libraries that, that we give to them, um, the, the build matrix is then kind of uh, pushed back to them. Uh, these are probably some of the likely suspects of things that we have to worry about. Um, the upshot here is that there's a finite number of simulators, so we can just kind of know what they are, try them out, and then uh, basically bake all of these, uh, all of this knowledge into the uh, verilated make files so that, you know, the IP vendors don't have to really understand this stuff, they just run the, run the tool and make you know, whatever targets they're interested in, or just, you know, all the targets. Uh, this is where we're at. It, uh, this is not landed, uh, but it is, it is working. Uh, so uh, check the branch out. There's some, uh, you know, uh, last few uh, refactorings to be done, and then, and then we can get this uh, in the trunk. But it does work. Uh, it's passing uh, Verilator CI, which is uh, an important aside if, uh, if you are a Verilator developer and you're not aware of the uh, continuous integration environment that's uh, relatively recent, so uh, check that out, can uh, save some time. Um, and then, yeah, so there's an example project, so you can see the flow, and also part of the uh, regression suite you can run, and um, there's some, some checking there to make sure the, the feature's working right. Uh, and it, it's also working, uh, the, the test also tested against XSIM, which is a uh, Xilinx simulator, so uh, we can see that the, uh, the Verilator code with the DPI wrapper works both with Verilator itself and also with, with XSIM. Uh, I'm not going to read all these to you, but there's definitely, uh, you know, a, a list of things to do to make this better. Um, but I think um, the, the feature as is, uh, is, is at least minimally viable. And uh, we can start getting some, uh, some traction with that. So, uh, yeah, please, uh, you know, check it out. Stay tuned. Uh, reach out if you're interested in hacking around with any of these things. And certainly, uh, please talk to uh, your IP vendors um, and, uh, and, and, and see what they think. Um, thanks for listening, and uh, I don't know if there's any more questions or if we kind of are, great. Uh, Todd, thank you very much. Uh, uh, interesting, to see. interesting, I think a lot of us have been doing this in various ways on an ad hoc basis. It's fairly normal when we develop a compiler pre-silicon for the customer wants to ship us the model as a very later model as a library. I think I'd caution one thing, once you go into the library space, you start to run into all sorts of version control issues and packaging issues. Because we've had libraries shipped to us and it turns out they built their libraries on a RHEL 4 system, which is a gazillion years old. And it wants versions of libraries that aren't on my nice up-to-date Ubuntu system. And so you run into the whole, at scale, you run into the whole packaging issue of, of how, how, how do you make this work. Um, and I'm sorry, I had to just briefly step out of the room there. I'm not sure if the question came up. Had you got within a use, within an open source context, what is the use case? Because the use case I've got is actually a closed source use case in that I'm doing an open source compiler, but for a closed source processor. Um, I wondered if there were any use cases where you actually would want to do this, where you're actually open source at the RTL level. Not, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I, I think. Uh, quite selfishly, the you know, the re reason I've been you know working with this is uh, to be able to try to like you know see if we can find ways to get 
you know, the IP vendors that we're working with to give us things that are more usable to us. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, I mean, in, in working on this, I've definitely bumped into a number, another number of people that have uh, other, uh, other kind of similar but uh, not, not quite the same interests. And so yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of ways to, um, to look at this. Uh, and then toward, towards the, the library point, yeah, I, I agree, like, uh, the, the devil's in the details. I think we'll need to, right, right now, um, you know, the, the, the Verilator uh, configure and make system certainly believes that it's kind of working in one system and we'll have to uh, strip it, uh, well, strip the library down as much as possible to, to make it as shippable as possible and probably also try to uh, constrain the, um, the build system so that, you know, we, we know what's going in there. All right, so uh, one other comment or thought. Um, I've recently been working with building my own interconnects. It's been a whole lot of fun, but there's a lot of proprietary crossbar interconnects out of there, and they are highly parameterized based on how many masters, how many slaves, what address range each ma uh, slave has, and so forth. I don't think there's any way you could build one component that would do every possible configuration. Uh, I mean, even just with the number of masters versus the number of slaves, I mean, I imagine you could uh, parameter, not parameterize, but uh, set the slave decoding with fixed wires. Uh, but, but the number of IOs changing, I think that would be a real problem. Yeah, so, so certainly parameters that uh, affect the, the pinout uh, would be, yeah, problematic at best, I think, um, perhaps, uh, Having some uh, maximum maximum value for those things uh, would be one potential workaround for that. Um, and then, yeah, like anytime you're talking about parameters that affect numbers of things, it's definitely getting into the uh, the more complicated case of thing. The, the the easy case for parameters is you know when you're testing if you know x equals foo or something like that, then you know the, 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 this is a gimme. I think that, that that's that's pretty easy to convert. Uh, I think what you're talking about is is, is definitely the harder case. Um, and so, yeah, we need, we need to explore that. Maybe kind of doing the same with the HDL, because it also allows to compile the HDL to some binary or, or shared library, and you can load it then. But it doesn't work, because the license in the HDL forces you to share the sources of your binary, the VHDL sources. So in this case, it would be if, as if you had to share the C sources of Verilator. Does that constraint exist with Verilator, or you are allowed to take any source with the binary? It's just because you didn't mention anything about the licenses? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I should probably know by heart what the, the Verilator licenses are. I know the, uh, the, the Verilator source is uh, under GPL version mumble. I don't, I don't remember. Um, but the, uh, the, the emitted code is under a permissive license. I believe it's the Perl artistic license. I would have to go back and check the... Uh, so, but it's definitely, the, the emitted code is definitely under a permissive license. And is it APL? Yeah, I, I would have to go back and check, but that, that, that's, that's for sure. Like the, the source, the, 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 the tool and the emitted code are two different things. It's, it's like the GCC model, it's, it's a, yeah. And then regarding parameters, in, in JSDL, the final binary allows top level parameters, but precisely that doesn't allow to optimize the final binary. So sometimes you don't, you don't want to have those parameters even if it's technically possible. Yeah, uh, yeah, great.